morning, church. How are you guys doing this morning? I got a great, I like that answer over there, fantastic answer. Uh, before we get started this morning, I'd like to just say thank you to Life for allowing me to come back over here and be able to bring the word to you guys in the Spring Valley campus. It's not too often I get to see you guys. I love all you guys. It's been a while since I've seen you, about five months, so thank you for having me. Um, this morning, if you would like to open up your Bibles uh, to Mark 12, verses 28 through 34. Um, and as you were trying to find your way to Mark 12, uh, I'm going to encourage you guys for the introduction of this that uh, we're going to have to use our imaginations a little bit. Not through the whole sermon, just for the introduction here, all right? I want to make that clear. Um, so imagine with me, real quick, if a stranger walked up to you, grabbed you by the hand, and said, I love you. Like, how would you react in that moment? Would you yank your hand back, or would you make it extremely awkward like I would, and I'd just let him hold on to it a little bit longer, right? Some of us would probably be startled, and some of us may want to reach out and call the cops, but regardless of your reaction, I'm sure it would be an event that you would tell your friends in the days and the weeks to come. Like every conversation would lean back to this dude grabbing your hand and saying he loved you. Now imagine with me again, if your spouse looked at you in just a sweet, intimate moment between your kids trying to burn down the house and she said, I love you. In that moment, I'm sure that comment would probably mean the world to you. You'd be like, man, I, I love you too. Now imagine with me one more time if it was your anniversary and you went to the store and you bought your spouse their favorite dinner. And on your way home from getting dinner, you remembered like, oh, there's that special gift that they've been talking about for the last two months. I'm going to stop and get that. Fellas, you know what gift this is because it's the one that's been dropped out in every passing conversation for two plus months. You go home. You cook their favorite meal, you wrap that special gift, and you stick it in the dining room, and on your way into the dining room, you hit play, and there's a little bit of Barry Manilow running in the background, like you're setting the scene up for just a wonderful moment with your wife. As you were sitting in this room, waiting for your wife to get home, you hear her car pull into the driveway, and in this moment, man, you're like, yes. Yes, it's the time. As you're anxiously waiting for her, you hear the garage door open up. You hear her car park. You hear the car door open up, the car door shut. You hear the garage door start shutting, and you hear her keys into the, the lock. Like, she's getting ready to come into the house, and you're, you're overwhelmed in this moment. You're like, yes. She steps into the house, and she pops into the dining room and she lays eyes on you and you're like excited. You're like, look at all I've done. And she looks at you and you say, I love you. And she responds back to you, do you? And you're a little nervous in your reply. You're like, yeah, yes, I love you. Look at all this that I've done for you. And she responds in that moment, your actions say you love me, but your heart is far from me. See, this is one of those comments that, that just kind of remains with you forever. It's one of those comments that no matter what you do, it impacts the rest of your life and what direction you're going to go in that relationship. See, and what we see this morning in this story that we're going to jump into, it's somewhat similar to that. Jesus, I'm going to give you the background. Jesus has made his final entry into Jerusalem. This is in the middle of Passion Week. The cross is set before him. And this is the conversation that comes out of the Pharisees and the Sadducees trying to raise accusations up against them. So they're asking questions. He's answering them. He's leaving them speechless. And they're like, we got nothing else. But in that conversation, one of the scribes comes forward and he dares ask Jesus one more question question. One more follow-up question. See, and this question that is asked is a question that is still relevant to our lives today. It is a question that when we meditate on it long enough, and when we think about Jesus' response to the question, it will not only impact our relationship with him, but it will begin to impact our relationship with others. See, Jesus' answer will begin to shape our lives 
And it has the ability to change the way that we interact with the people around us if we apply his teaching. So I invite you this morning, open up to Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 34. That's Mark 12, 28 through 34. This morning we are going to read the text in its entirety. And we're going to begin to unpack the text um, after we pray. So, one of the scribes came and heard them arguing. And recognizing that he had answered them well, asked him, him as Jesus, what commandment is the foremost of all? Jesus' answer, Jesus answered, the foremost is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. The scribe said to him, right, teacher, you have stated that he is one and there is no one else besides him and to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as himself is much more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he had answered him intelligently, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one would venture to ask him any more questions. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just ask for a tremendous amount of clarity as we dive into your word this morning. Uh, Father, I pray that as we dig in and we touch on the subject of love, that, Father, that you will speak clearly to our hearts and you will reveal to us what we need this morning, Lord. It's in your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. So the question that was presented to Jesus, what commandment is the foremost of all, was not an unfamiliar question to Jesus. This was a question that was discussed in great lengths against the, the uh, religious elite back in the day. See, you see, in the day, rabbis counted 613 individual statutes of the law. 365 were considered negative and 248 were positive. So attempts were being made by the rabbis to differentiate between the heavy or the great commandments or the light and the little commandments, saying, which commandments do we need to live by? There's 613 of them, like which one should we obey? The Jewish people were trying to figure out which ones were the most important. So the Jewish people lived life based on a strict adherence to the law. They based their lives on keeping the law, and their faith had developed into a works-based righteousness. So Jesus was confronting this idea of what commandment is the foremost of all so that I may obey it, and he was saying, love. So when the scribe asked Jesus this question, I want you to get this, I believe he was asking from a sincere position. He wasn't asking like the other Pharisees and the Sadducees. He actually was a little brave in coming forth with his question. So normally, when someone answers something well, in my experience, no one usually answers or responds with another sarcastic question. So once the original question is answered, it stirred the heart of the scribe, and that led to this follow-up question. So the Lord's response is what I want you to see, and as always, his response was perfect and absolutely accurate to the question. We're going to read the text. Jesus replied to the scribe, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. When Jesus responded to the scribe, he responded by quoting the Old Testament. Okay, that's Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. And what Jesus quoted was something called the Shema. In Shema, the word translates to hear, and it comes from the first word of the confession of faith. So Jesus responded to the scribe in a way that was very familiar to what he was thinking and then in this, he also came back with Leviticus 19.18, which emphasizes love for, one, love for one's neighbor. So Jesus' response to the scribe, he made love the most important thing in life. 
as later penned by the Apostle Paul in Romans 13, 8 through 10, when he says, love is the fulfilling of the law. So Jesus responded, you want to know what? You asked for the best law, I'll give you two of them. And in that, the scribe knew exactly what he was talking about. So, But let's look at this word love for a minute, because uh, I'll be honest with you, love is... Love is, I'm a man, it's love's hard sometimes, all right? But love is an all-inclusive affection. You get that, it's all-inclusive. Love is the most personal of all the affections that God has created you to have. It is the tenderest, the most unselfish, the most divine of all the affections that you have. There's a reason why we love our spouse. It's a, it's a divine affection. See, love is also a verb, which means it is an action. You show your love by putting it into work. Our love should be demonstrated in our actions towards God. And this is the very thing that the religious elite were missing. See, they were putting their love on keeping the law. They were not hey, aiming their love at loving God. They were loving the law. They were not loving God. They had a desire to pursue his standards, but many of them lacked love for him. So this is the significant part. If we dig into this response a little deeper, we see this word all come to the forefront. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. This word all in the Greek is significant. Listen to me. All means all. Right? Everything. We are to love God with our everything we have with every major faculty of our body. Our entire being should be offered up to God in love. He's saying, love God. And our love should be on display in our heart. See, the heart in the Hebrew understanding is the very core of a person's identity. From the heart flows the things that are in, right? So it says, Proverbs 4.23, guard your heart with all diligence, for from it flows the springs of life. Soul our love should be on display in our soul. You're thinking, what's the soul got to do with it? It's our emotions. So are your emotions showing your love for God? And then your mind. See, our love should be on display in our mind. Our mind embraces our will, our intentions, and our purposes. As Romans 8, 6 says, for the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. And then our love should be on display in our strength. Strength refers to the physical energy and function of our body. See, the significance of these four traits, heart, soul, mind, and strength, is that all four of the elements are unique to being human. God gave you those elements. And God has created you with these, and all of them should be involved in our love for God. This is where the religious elite were missing it. They were dividing their love for God. I have love in my strength to do your law, but my heart was very far from you. It's kind of like the example I gave you at the very beginning. We like doing things for our wife, but we don't love our wife like we should. So this is what gets us jammed up from time to time. This is the most important part, is when our love becomes divided towards God, we allow the sins and the hooks of sin to come into our heart and separate us from the love that we have for God. We're choosing in that moment, I want the sin that seems more enticing to me than the love for God. And this is what Jesus is responding to completely. He's saying, if your love for me was complete, you wouldn't have to worry about these other things. So the significance of this is that it's a genuine love for God. It's an intelligent love. It's an emotional love, a willing love, and an active love. In short, it is a comprehensive, all-consuming love and a singular adoration for who he is. God's wholehearted love for believers must not be reciprocated with half-hearted devotion towards him. And that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, look, your love for me is divided. I don't have everything. See, and what is interesting, I want you to look at the list, the heart, soul, mind, and strength. What comes first? The heart. The heart is an organ of performance. 
See, it's not about what you are doing. It is an organ of preference. I said that wrong. Because the heart is not an organ of performance. It's an organ of preference. See, the heart prefers things, and then we do those things in accordance with our preferences. The first command is loving God with all of your preference. Prefer God above everything else. As it says in Job 22, it says, allow God to be your gold, your silver, and your everything. See, this call to love God is an all-inclusive love. It's not separated. And this leads us into our key truth of the morning. The heart of love is delighting, not doing. The heart of love is delighting, not doing. Let that sit for a moment. Do you have a heart that delights in God? See, the essence of loving is delighting when God is the object. We can actually get too confused. Loving God is not working for God. Loving God in itself is delighting in all of his ways. Delighting in his presence. Delighting in his promises. Delighting in his times of suffering. Delighting in his times of correction. Delighting in his times of provision. Delighting in his presence when things do not make sense. See, we like to delight in the Lord when it's easy. But do you delight in the Lord when it's hard? See, if we are completely focused on loving God and delighting in God, we will naturally begin to act upon the second commandment that he gives of loving our neighbor. See, our love for God that is on display in our heart, soul, mind, and strength will manifest itself in our love for our neighbor. So Jesus' words, I want to stop for a second. Jesus' words as yourself He's not justifying a position of self-love advocated by modern psychology, right? He wasn't trying to say you need to love yourself more to have a healthy self-image. He wasn't channeling his inner Dr. Phil. He wasn't trying to give you 21 steps for a better you. What he was actually saying, listen to me, is we love ourselves far too much. And the love that we show ourselves, we should actually be showing to God. And when we show that amount of love to God, we're still falling short of the amount of love that God deserves. See, God deserves far much more than what we give him. And at the end of this conversation between Jesus and the scribe, the scribe acknowledges that Jesus has spoken wisely. And the scribe takes the response further. He says, loving God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength is greater than every sacrifice and every offering. Essentially, the scribe is saying, loving God is better than anything that we can possibly do for God. Now listen, Jesus responded to the scribe acknowledging that he was not far from the kingdom of God. And as I was studying through this text, I was like, what does that mean? It means that God's word was challenging him in his current thinking. See, our love for God should challenge what we are thinking. See, it means he was beginning to wrestle with the key truths of what Jesus was opening up. The scribe's entire thought process got shook by the very words that Jesus spoke of loving God. See, does our love look like that? When we step in the word, does it shake the very foundation that we are on? Are we like, man, I didn't see that, and that goes against completely everything I've ever thought in my life. See, that's this love for God. See, and this is where the text stirred me this week as I was actually going through it and I was praying through it, is that this scribe, the scribe answered Jesus, and I'm like, man. So I put myself in his shoes, and the scribe, listened to this, knew all about the law. He knew all about keeping the law. He would even hang out with his religious buddies discussing the law and trying to figure out which one was the best one, but he was completely missing the point of a relationship with God. And this is where it hit me at. Some of us do the exact same things. We have made our own laws to keep track of every week. We go to church. We read our Bibles. We attend small groups. 
we are guilty of knowing far more scripture than what we are willing to apply to our life. And I'm scared to say some of us are completely missing the point. Our list of doing is not go to church, read your Bible. Our list should be of loving God. One of my mentors once told me if it was important, you would make time for it. And the further I walk into this, the the more I understand that very comment. See, if I had a love for it, I would make time for it. See, and we do not, this is where, this is where, like, my thought process was blown away. If we do not inherit eternal life by works, what are we trying to work our way there for? See, we do not inherit eternal life by works. That is what the religious elite were trying to do. We are saved by our faith in Christ. That's Ephesians 2.8 and his completed work on the cross. All of the laws are fulfilled in him. That's Matthew 5. And when we have faith in his completed work, our hearts will be turned back towards God and we should have a desire to know him. We should have a love for him that encapsulates everything we do, heart, soul, mind, strength. If our focus is to love God and the things we do, we will begin to naturally flow out of our time that we spend with him. See, our impact to others is when we spend time with him. See, and I know what we're thinking. I find my purpose in what I'm doing. I get it. I was an electrician for 20 years. I know what that feels like. But let me explain. If what we are doing is keeping you from going the full distance with God, you are missing the point. See, in Jesus' response to the scribe, he aimed at his heart, exposing the truth about a work-based righteousness. God does not desire for you to be overly busy with the things that you're doing. He's not wanting you to earn your salvation. He desires for you to love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It encompasses your entire being that he's created you that way to be. And as I was praying through these verses this week, God met me with an extremely difficult question. And because he met me with the question, I'm going to give that question to you. The question halted me in my thought process. See, the question that God asked me was this. Do you love me completely? Do you love me in such a way that it encompasses your heart, mind, soul, and strength? See, and I think we are quick to answer yes. But what is troubling is some of our actions can reveal a different story. And as I was thinking about that question... God in his abundance, because he's a God of abundance, rolled seven others out onto me. So I'm going to share those with you also. Do I have a love for knowing him? Do I love him without hesitation? Do I have enough love for him that I am able to sit in his word Do I have a love that desires to make him known or make much of him? Do I have a love towards God that is willing to sit in the difficult truths and allow him to change my mind? Do I have enough love for him that I am willing to lose some friends because of my zealousness for him? Are you willing to walk out of the house with Jesus every morning? And do I have enough love for God to walk in obedience? That one was probably the most challenging. See, no doubt these are some difficult questions, but I believe God asked me so that I would go further in my love relationship with him. See, and as I was processing through these questions, God met me with a sweet verse that makes more sense to me. It's actually Philippians 2.12, and it says at the back side of it, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. See, we are quick to say that we love God, but we are very quick to not want to work anything out with him. So God gives us these things because he wants all of us. He wants our heart, our souls, our minds, our strengths. And he desires everything that we do to flow out of that love relationship that we have with him. 
So the question, more than anything, of heart, soul, mind, and strength is, do you love him? And as I was processing through this, I'm going to close with a quote this morning from Matthew Henry. Um, it's not going to be on the board, so if you want it, I can send it to you. Um, he says this, all the law is fulfilled in one word, and that is love. All obedience begins in the affections, and nothing in religion is done right that is not done there first. Love is the leading affection which gives law and gives ground to the rest and should first be secured with God. Man is a creature cut out for love. Therefore, the law is written on the heart. That is the law of love. And love is a short and sweet word. And if that be the fulfilling of the law, surely the yoke of the command is very easy. Love is the rest and the satisfaction of the soul. If we walk in this good old way, we shall find rest. So church, if you're looking for rest this morning, look to your heart for your love for God because that's the only place that we're going to find rest. End of quote. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this morning of being able to come together and celebrate who you are. But Father, as we leave today, Lord, I pray that the love that is on our hearts, um, Lord, is not only encouraging to us in our relationship with you, but it is encouraging to others so that we can walk the distance that you've called us to be, that we can leave the house strapped with Jesus every day, Lord. So Father, I just pray that you continue to work on the hearts of us and drive us deeper into the gospel that Jesus came to die for, Lord. It's in your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Amen.